this one off, Brother Jerry. Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, if you've got your place, stand with us. We have uh, decided to finish out this year uh, preaching through the gospel, uh, step by step, and uh, I have stated before that I do believe there are many details about the gospel day, the gospel record, uh, that as a whole the church overlooks. We know how the story Ends. We know the main point that he died, and then we know that he resurrected, and uh, and so there's a lot of it that sometimes we don't pay much attention to, and so I wanted to take uh, the last several weeks of the year and go through the gospel slowly, step by step. Brother James, you can bump me down just uh, a hair; it's ringing up here on me, and uh, and so we started in the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, we went from there uh, into Pilate's Hall, which we call the Hall of Humiliation, and we spent some time there. And, uh, and now we are going out of Pilate's Hall, and in Mark chapter 15, and verse number 20, Mark chapter 15, and verse number 20, And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. Verse number 20, I want you to notice that they have now led him out to crucify him. And so this morning and the next few weeks, I do want to preach to you on the road to redemption. The road to redemption. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the scripture. And Lord, thank you for giving us every word that you've given us, even even if they give not much bearing to the weight of the gospel, such as this account we will look at today, I am so thankful that you have placed every detail in your word that you've given to us. I pray as we look at it this morning, I pray as we examine it, I pray that you will teach us from it and, and guide us to something wonderful today. I pray that you will enrich our hearts, enrich our minds. I pray that we will be able to further and more deeply appreciate you and what you've done for us and what it means that you are our Savior. I pray this morning that you will get honor and glory out of the preaching. I pray that it will be received with an open heart and open mind. I pray that it will be received with the spirit of worship and a spirit of gratitude. And God, I pray that you will uh, enjoy this message. I pray that it will help our people. And Lord, I pray that you will get honor and glory out of this service. Help me not to hinder anything. Please cleanse me of myself and of my sin, and don't let me hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things, and the church said, Amen. Thank you for standing. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him. They had placed that on him in verse 17. They took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. The trials are over. We've spent some time looking at those trials. He was tried before Annas. He was tried before Caiaphas. He was tried before the Sanhedrin there in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Caiaphas' place in the palace of perjury that we called it. And he has been tried, he has been examined. He was led there to, from there to Pilate, where Pilate examined him. And, and over and over and over again, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. But yet still, the crowd said, no, he must die. He's made himself the son of God. He's made himself a king. We have no king but Caesar, and he must die. And he has been tried, he has been examined, he has been questioned. He has gone on and been, been, been put before Herod. And, and Herod tried to talk to him, and he wouldn't even speak to Herod. And, and so Herod mocks him and then sends him back. But those trials are over now. No more questions. Uh, no more getting in his face. Uh, no more blasphemy. All, that's over. The torturing has been completed. They have tied him to a stone. They have beaten him with a cat of nine tails. They have blindfolded him. They have struck him in the face, asking him to prophesy and say, Who smote you? They've spit on him. They've plucked the, the beard out of his face. They have... Uh, mocked him, soldiers have gathered around him and bowed their knee, acting like he was a king, and, and they have tortured him, but all that's over. The whip has been put away, the reed has been 
removed, and now it's finally over. Now Jesus can finally just go die. But Rome has yet affliction still to give, and he has to travel to where he will die. They led him out to crucify him. Obviously, they're not going to crucify someone in the middle of Pilate's hall. They're not going to do that. They're not going to kill him in the courtroom. They're going to have to lead him out of town. And Rome will not let this be simple, nor relieving. Every moment and every detail of crucifixion, Rome has designed uh, to crush its victims inside and out. And so now comes the dreaded Via Doloroso, the road to Calvary. They led him out to crucify him. Our generation or our culture would, would, would think it's similar to the walk down death row and walking past all the cells and that long, many of you have probably seen the Green Mile and you think of that event and as they lead him down the, the, the long hallway, this was much worse than that, but that's probably the closest thing you and I might could come to. This road that they would lead uh, down to go to, to Calvary to crucify someone. It's known as the Via Dolorosa, and, uh, and they would, it led straight to Calvary. Now, Calvary, you must understand, though it is found one time in the Scripture, and though Calvary means much to us, that is not a Christian title. The place where Jesus died was not named Calvary because Jesus died there. Now, it has become synonymous with our faith. It has become synonymous, and even great churches like ours are named after it. But this word did not originate with our faith. Uh, this place did not receive a new title because Jesus died there. Uh, many people died there before and after Jesus. Calvary just means cranium or skull. You've probably heard it called the place of the skull. That's another uh, way the Bible names it. But that's what Calvary means. And so Christ was not the first nor the last to be crucified here. And so thus Rome had a system. Rome had a system of getting someone from Pilate's Hall to Calvary. And they had a system. And, and this was normal everyday business for Rome. And they would crucify people often. And, uh, and it was a capital punishment for a capital crime. And, uh, and so Rome had a system. Someone condemned to crucifixion in Pilate's hall would be led down the Via Dolorosa, V-I-A-D-O-L-O-R-O-S-A, Dolorosa. And, uh, and they would go down the street, they would lead him down through town, and, and, uh, and so the process or the procession would begin. There would be uh, first a trumpet player would go out. Many times when we have a funeral procession and, and a, a police officer will pull out on the road, turn his blue lights on and his siren, and let everyone know, hey, there's about to be a procession. Get out of the way. Pull over and stop and move. And, and so first there would be a trumpet player would walk down the road, and he would blow his trumpet and uh, making an announcement to clear the road and get people's attention. Now, when Jesus was crucified, it was fairly early in the day, and so the streets were busy, the markets were full, and there was a lot going on in town. And, uh, and, and so as they're leading convicts down this road, it would not be safe for people just transversing across, especially with children. And so a trumpet player would march through first, blowing his trumpet, letting everybody know to get out of the way. Second, a centurion would ride on his, on his horse, and following after him would be a man holding a sign. And after him would be a, a man condemned to die, then another man with another sign, and then after him another man condemned to die, and then after him another man holding a sign, and after him, the last man condemned to die. On those signs would be the names of the men condemned and their charge, what they were, their crime, what they were charged with. For example, the, these thieves that were uh, crucified with Christ, they had signs as well, and their signs would have said thief or insurrection or murder, what, you know, whatever their charges were against, so that everyone would know why this man's being crucified. He is being crucified because he's a thief, because he is a murderer, because he is a, re a rebel, an insurrectionist. And so they would have a sign. And so in front of Jesus walks a man with a large sign written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And it says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That was his charge. And Christ received no special treatment. He was not the first man to walk down this road. He was not the only man with a sign. And this was how they would crucify people. They would lead them down this infamous and ominous road, the Via Dolorosa. And so Jesus and these other men are being led down this road. I want you to notice first, Jesus, His company. His company. 
Christ was crucified, but not by himself. There were other men that died with him. We all know that. And Christ was crucified in the middle, right? And so it would stand a reason that if Christ was crucified in the middle, he was probably led in the middle. He was probably the second in line of, of these convicts. And going down the road was three men condemned to death, capital punishment for a capital crime, and led down the road in public for all to see as an example of shame. Children, don't do this. Don't become that because this is what happens to you. If you're a thief, if you're a, a, a murderer, an insurrectionist, if you claim to be king, this is what happens to you. Don't, don't do this. In Isaiah 53, in verse number 12, a prophecy about Christ and his death was that he was numbered with the transgressors. And if you were just a, a, a bystander there in Jerusalem that day, watching this awful parade, you would see Jesus, the Son of God, not knowing who he was, but you see him numbered with these other guys, these other awful criminals that have been sentenced to die. And if you remember, the Pharisees accused Jesus previously of being a friend of publicans and sinners. Well, he has, he has far surpassed that accusation now. He's much more than just their friend. Now he walks the lowest road that a man could walk. He, how, and how true it was what David said in Psalms, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And truly Jesus Christ has known the highest of the highs and even the lowest of the lows that humanity could ever experience. His entrance into this world, Jesus, this is the Christmas season, His entrance into this world may have been beautiful, but oh, how different was His exit. This is ugly, this is shameful, this is embarrassing, this is grotesque, this is unfortunate to say the absolute least. His company, His company. But if you're standing by looking at these men, they're very hard to distinguish and recognize who they are and so as to not lose Jesus amongst the criminals, we notice also his crown. His crown. Brother James, my remote's not working. You pick up for him if you don't mind. His crown. Now, if you were standing by this road watching this, this parade of, of death, watching the last moments of these three men, one would stand out to you. One would stick out and be easily identified between the other two. Now, not because one was God, but you couldn't see that in this moment. This is a mangled, bleeding pile of flesh. You do not see God in that. You don't see Creator in that. You don't see Prince of Peace. You do not see a great preacher. You do not see God in that. Not because one would resurrect a few days later. Now, all of those men were going to die, but one was going to resurrect from the grave in just a few days. But you don't know that. You can't see that. There are no signs giving that away. Yet one would still stand out because of what he was wearing. Because of what he was wearing. The other two were not wearing a crown, but Jesus was still wearing his crown. In verse 17, if you'll look at it please, in Mark 15, verse 17, And they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head. And so as they begin to mock him and, and abuse him, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they beat it into uh, his face, and and they put that on him there, also with a robe of purple, mocking his uh, supposed royalty. But in verse number 20, when they had finished mocking him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and let him out to crucify him. So we know they took the purple robe off, but there's no evidence anywhere in the Bible that they ever took his crown off. They never took the crown of thorns off. So going down the road in this procession, one of them is wearing a crown. It is a crown made out of thorns. And how fitting that was. His charge was claiming to be king. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. So why not let him wear his crown? This crown of thorns, I told you previously, was, was an imitation uh, of the victor's wreath that they would wear. Kings and generals would proudly wear a wreath made out of ivy and olive leaves for, uh, for, for, for attaining a great victory in a battle, maybe over another nation or, or some great victory. Maybe it was a campaign victory or something like that. But it was a victor's wreath and it was a, a complete mockery mocking his uh, claims of being king. Now, you know that thorns were the curse of sin. When God cursed the ground, he, he cursed it in Genesis 3 and put thorns there. And, and so as they make this crown of thorns, they make a crown 
of sin and place it on Jesus' head. And, and, and how wonderful, because Jesus has been battling sin since the Garden of Eden. He's been battling sin since He was born and laid in a manger in the wilderness with Satan in Matthew 4. Jesus fought against sin. With every sermon that Jesus ever preached, He fought against sin. Every time the Pharisees came and accosted Him, Jesus fought against sin. With every miracle that He performed, with every healing that He gave, He fought against sin. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we can see as He as he's uh, sweating out blood and tears, he fought against sin. Before Caiaphas, he fought sin. Before Pilate, he fought sin. Before Herod, Jesus fought sin. And thank God, he won against sin. So yes, give the man his crown. Give the man his crown of sin. He has won. He has conquered. O oh, glorious champion, give it to him. Let him wear it. He gladly embraces it, wears his crown all the way to his death. The conqueror of sin, yes, give the man his crown. Let him be identifiable. Let him stand out amongst the other transgressors. He's the one. Yes, he's dying for sin, but he's defeating sin. Yes, give the man his crown. Absolutely. How beautiful. How beautiful that Jesus wore his crown all the way to his death. His crown. But notice thirdly, his condition. His condition. Under the load of this cross, Christ's broken body is in unbelievable pain and stress. We know that he is weary. I mean, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples were falling asleep because they were tired. Jesus was just as tired as they were. He was already tired, but then he was wounded. He was wounded. The abuse that he suffered, the scourging and the beating was, was vicious, and most men did not even survive that. But Jesus did. In Isaiah 52, he said, We were astonished at thee. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. His visage, that's his face. And so as you looked at this line of men and saw this man with a crown, you wouldn't look at his face and recognize him by name because his visage is so marred. He's not recognizable by his name. But then Isaiah went a step further and said that his form was so marred it was more than the sons of men. And so as you looked at this line of men, you wouldn't even recognize him as a man. You wouldn't even recognize Jesus by his nature. He is there in the form of a man, but his form is so beaten and so wounded and so distorted, you can't even recognize him as a human. He's just a pile of flesh. He was wounded. David did say it right in Psalms 22 in verse number 6, that prophecy of the cross where he said, I am a worm and no man. A worm has no form. A worm has no structure. Jesus was wounded, leaving him weak. And I know that sounds almost wrong to even say that Jesus was weak. But surely you can comprehend with all of that physical stress and blood loss and dehydration, surely you understand the physical weakness Christ was in. Surely you can, I know he's God, but surely you can see past that and see that he was in a man's body and was experiencing a great moment of weakness. In Matthew chapter 4, as he's fasted 40 days in temptation, he was so weary that the angels had to come to his aid. Do you remember that? In the Garden of Gethsemane, as Jesus again was fasting and praying and, and, and toiling with his father, he was so weary and so weakened that the angels had to come again and minister to him, but they cannot come now. They cannot come down out of the sky and come down to this road as Jesus is, is falling under the weight of that cross. No angel can come. Michael cannot come. Gabriel, they cannot come. All of the hosts of heaven, they cannot come to his aid. They cannot carry that cross for him. They cannot encourage him. They cannot strengthen him. They cannot bring him a glass of water. They cannot give him a hand. They cannot assist him in any way. An angel cannot come. But Christ is weak. Christ is suffering. Christ is falling. And, and, and Christ, his body, his form, the veil of flesh that he was in was ripped to shreds. His muscle tissue ripped to shred. His tendons have been separated. His, he has no form. His bones are looking at him. He is in a mess and he has to carry this cross through this weakness. And so this opens up one of the most beautiful moments in the history of mankind. 
completely unnecessary. God didn't have to tell it to us. God didn't have to put it in here. And it absolutely makes no bearing on the truth of the gospel, on the power of the gospel. But yet, in verse number 21, God includes a brief moment, a brief, a brief detail of a man named Simon who was compelled to carry the cross with Jesus. In verse 21, would you look at it with me? Verse 21, Mark 15 and verse 21 and they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. In the book of Matthew, he also records this event in Matthew 27 and verse 32. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Luke says almost the exact same thing. But Luke says they laid hold on him to bear the cross after Jesus. And so in Christ's condition, His broken body, Christ needs some assistance. Christ needs someone to help carry that cross. Rome fears He may even die in the middle of the road, thus voiding out the whole need for the cross and the crucifixion. They cannot take time. This needs to hurry before He dies there in the middle of the road. And so Simon must be apprehended. Somebody must help carry this cross. And so as we look at the road to redemption this morning, I want you to see Simon's service. Simon's service. Now, we do not know much about Simon. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, the ones that all kind of say the same thing and carry the same, uh, uh, cover the same events, they all mention Simon by name, which is astounding, but they all only give him one verse. They all only give him one verse. And so we do not know much about Simon. Now, there is much speculation about Simon. There are many songs written about Simon. You've probably heard the song about Simon and his, and his sons there looking at the lamb, and you might have heard that. And There's lots of uh, theatrical drama that is read into the story of Simon. I'm not against that. I'm, I'm, sure there was, I'm sure it was not a blank event. I'm sure it was not an emotionless event. And, but the event of Simon, God does not, uh, does not divulge a lot of information about this man named Simon, so why even write it down? Why go through the, the trouble of having Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write this down? Matthew and Luke probably being eyewitness accounts to this event, write this down and, and include this event of Simon. Now we don't know much about him, but we do know where he's from. In Mark 15 and verse 21, they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian. Matthew and Luke, they all include that he was from Cyrene. Well, where is Cyrene? Cyrene is Libya, Africa. Libya, Africa. Now, with all probability, without stretching anything whatsoever, Simon the Cyrenian was an African man, was a black man, more than likely. An African, possibly, maybe a proselyte to the Jewish religion, and so adopting the Hebrew name, Simon, the most prominent of Hebrew names. Maybe that's what, why he's named Simon. Maybe he was just born and his father gave him the name Simon. But regardless, the man's from Africa, a son of Ham. A son of Ham. And there behind and in front of Jesus are two men just like himself, Jews, sons of Shem. There in front and behind those two, those three men, stands Roman centurions, sons of Japheth. And so there on the road to the cross, the road to redemption, stands a son of Ham, a son of Shem, and a son of Japheth. How about that? How about all of that tying together and every race in the planet earth ties in to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ through Ham, Sham, and Japheth? How true the verse rings from 1 John chapter 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, not just the Jews, but for the sins of the whole world, the sins of Shem, the sins of Ham, and the sins of Japheth. Now, this is not the sermon at all, but how about that for the white supremacists? The person that helped your Savior, that died for your sin and kept your sorry soul out of hell, was a black man. But what a beautiful picture. But still, we don't know a whole lot about this moment. And to be honest with you, Christianity would really like to know a lot more. 
This moment where Jesus and Simon both together carried the cross. What a beautiful moment. And, and truly, we would love to know much more about it. But God saw fit not to tell us very much. But I've come this morning to tell you the three facts we do know about this moment. There's only one verse, and all three Gospels, just one verse. So we can't stretch it too far. But there are three facts about this that I do want you to see. First fact this morning, if you're taking notes, that Jesus and Simon, they were both busy. They were both busy. Now Jesus, we obviously we know what He's doing. <laughs> he's about to pay for the sins of the whole world. He's financing salvation. He's, he's finishing the work which God gave him to do. He is fulfilling the Old Testament. He's fulfilling the law of God. He's answering every sin that's ever been committed and ever will be committed. Je we know what Jesus is doing. He's, he's busy. All right, don't interrupt the man. He's doing something important. All right, don't, don't, don't try to distract him. Jesus is busy. But Simon was also busy. All three gospel accounts give that he, he, was, he was passing by. He was coming out of the country. He was, he was doing something. He wasn't just sitting there eating breakfast. He was, he was busy as well. Now, Jewish tradition and, and some history says that Simon was returning from the field gathering wood. Now, that's significant because we do know for a fact that the day that Jesus was, was crucified was the day of the preparation. They're about to have the Passover and all that, and, and, and the Day of Atonement is at hand. And, and so they're getting ready to sacrifice their lamb. And so they, they had the day of the preparation, the day when the lamb was selected, the wood was gathered for the altar. And, and so Jewish tradition says that Simon was, was coming back from the field gathering wood to bring it back uh, uh, to get ready for the sacrifice of the typical lamb that the Jews would sacrifice every year at this feast. And so tradition tells us that as Simon is walking by, he's carrying a load of, uh, of, of wood for this fire, and then they stop him, and he has to lay that wood down for the typical lamb and go pick up the wood for the real lamb, God's lamb, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Now that sounds pretty good and feels pretty good, but I don't know if that's true. I would like for it to be true. I, I wish there was someone that, was, that could verify that, but I don't know. Regardless, I don't know what he was doing. I do know he was busy. And both Jesus and Simon were busy men. They were occupied with the task. They were busy. But we also know from verse 21 they were both burdened. They were both burdened. Jesus is coming down the road struggling to bear His cross. His body torn to shreds. His body, all the blood almost gone. His, his bones and His organs are visible just by looking at Him. And so, I, I don't think it blasphemous to say he was struggling there. And he's trying to carry this load, this cross. And so there is much debate, this is not part of the message, but there is much debate on what did the cross look like, what was the shape. Some say it's a, a, an X cross, some say it's that T cross, but I, I don't think any of those are, are, could be because... The sign that was carried in front of Jesus was later nailed over his head. And so if he's on an X cross, there's nothing over his head. If he's on that T cross, there's, again, nothing over his head to hang a big sign. And so the Christian cross, the Latin cross, one on our Christian flag, and the symbol of Christianity, I think that's probably accurate. It was a, a cross a, shaped like a T. And he's trying to carry that, and it's extremely heavy, and he's struggling. And so Simon was... Was, was apprehended, was compelled to come and, and bear the cross after Jesus. And so these men were both burdened. And let me just say, it's much better for Simon to bear the cross of Christ than to bear the sins of Simon. Because while Jesus appears to be bearing a cross, He's bearing much more than a cross. The piece of wood was not His only burden. The, the burden that was on Jesus was the wrath of God. The, the burden that was on Christ was your sin and my sin and Simon's sin and Pilate's sin and Herod's sins and Judas' sins and Peter's sins and James' sin and John's sins and your sin and my sin, your children's sin, the sins of the whole world, the sins of Ham, the sins of Shem, the sins of Japheth. They're all burdened on Christ. Far better for Simon to help carry the cross than bear that sin. Far better for Simon to help carry that cross than to try to bear the sins of humanity or even the sins of himself. Yes, Simon had the easy part. Well, Jesus had the hardest part. 
And they were both busy, they were both burdened. But would you also understand that they were both bloody? They were both bloody. Jesus is bleeding from everywhere He possibly can. From His pores, from His eyes, from His face, from every pore in His body, every vein, the man is bleeding from everywhere possible. And the cross that He carried was doubtlessly covered in Jesus' blood. Doubtlessly it's running down the cross member. Doubtlessly it's probably pulling behind Him with every step that He takes. There's, there's leaving a trail of and most of you men have deer hunt or have deer hunted, and you know what it means to follow a blood trail. And doubtlessly, Jesus left a blood trail bleeding from everywhere. And as Simon is commissioned to come and, and help carry this cross, he cannot help but get it on himself. He cannot help but get it on his face and on his hands and on his shoulders and, and on his chest, running down his own back. His clothes will be forever stained with the blood of this man. And, and this blood, he cannot help but get it on himself. And so there in the middle of the road stands two men covered in the same blood. There stands Jesus and there stands Simon, both of them covered in the blood of Christ. Now, at face value, you might think they're both bleeding. That's both of their blood. But you'd be wrong, friend. You'd be completely wrong. Simon wasn't bleeding. That wasn't Simon's blood. And good for him, it was Jesus' blood. And so as man looks at the road, they see this parade. They see this road and they watch it. They see two men covered in blood. And as God looks down from heaven, he sees two men covered in the same blood. He sees Simon covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And can I say how wonderful for Simon and how wonderful for you and how wonderful for me to God to look down upon you and not see your blood but to see Jesus Christ's blood. These are both bloody men. Simon has now been covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And oh glorious day, the day that the blood of Jesus Christ covered me. It'd be no good if Jesus was covered in Simon's blood. That would mean nothing. That would get no one anywhere. Wouldn't get Jesus anywhere. Wouldn't get Simon anywhere. But since Simon was covered with Jesus' blood, it changed everything. What a wonderful thing to be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this. The only way that Simon was able to get that blood on him was he had to accept Jesus' cross. What? Here's the Roman centurions. Here's the Roman soldiers. Pick it up, big fella. We know you can handle it. But they didn't want it. So they didn't get the blood. Simon was compelled by accepting. They laid hold on him like there was some resistance, some hesitation. But through accepting that task, accepting that cross, he received the blood of Jesus Christ. And what a marvelous moment. When the blood of Jesus Christ covers someone else. But I do want you to notice how this changed this man. You say, but there's only one verse and it just goes right on and doesn't talk about him again. No, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not. But the rest of Scripture has some echoes that tell us that this moment changed Simon. It even changed his family. Mark gives us this record in Mark 15. Would you look at it again in verse 21? Mark 15 and verse 21. And they compel one Simon of Cyrenian who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now Mark doesn't tell us who Alexander and Rufus were. He just mentions their names like, like everyone already knows who they are. Now the gospel of Mark was written to the, the, the Romans... And so it was, it was like he said, you know, Alexander's daddy, Rufus's daddy. Now, if my father walked in, he would be known, oh, that's Brother Levi's daddy. That's, that's the father of, 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 of Levi. And so Simon the Cyrenian was known by, as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Evidently, Alexander and Rufus were in church and were somewhat significant. If you, you don't have to turn there, but in the book of Romans, as Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome, as he's closing it, he gives a lot of salutations. Salute so-and-so. Salute so-and-so. And, and in verse 13, he says, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord. And so Rufus is not a nobody. He's evidently got uh, 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 some position. He's evidently got some ministry, some impact, some spirituality about him and the church. And so as Paul writes this about Rufus, he says, salute him. He's chosen in the Lord. Then he says this, and his mother and mine. And his mother and mine. Now, 
Paul was not the brother of Rufus. They, they were not biological siblings. But Rufus and Alexander and Simon and their mother have evidently been so changed by this event of Simon bearing the cross of Christ. The blood had covered Simon and evidently covered his soul and put faith in his heart and his wife's heart and his children's heart. They had evidently joined part of the church. And so by the time the apostle Paul comes along, he is Saul of Tarsus. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He... And he does a complete 180. He turns around. He gets saved. He starts worshiping Jesus Christ, starts preaching for Christ, and he loses everything. The Pharisees take everything from him. His family disowns him. So here is a man without mother or father, without family, without friend, without someone to help him. And he comes and he gets part of the church. And here is this lady, Simon's wife, the mother of Rufus. And she evidently played some type of motherly role to encourage the great apostle Paul. And so he writes, You, you salute her too. Rufus' mother and mine, and evidently this family had been drastically changed by what happened when Simon met Jesus at the cross. And how it changes a family. How the bearing of the cross of Christ changes a family. How it takes a man who we knew nothing about and puts him in the church. How it takes a man and changes his wife and changes his children and puts them in the family of God. Even so much that they begin to minister and be a blessing and their names are forever penned in the scriptures. They're immortal. No one will never forget Simon of Cyrenian. We didn't know who he was before. We'll never forget him now. How the cross changes a man. How it changes a family. Has it changed your family? Has it changed your children? Has it changed your wife? Has it changed your spouse? Has it changed your church? Has it changed the way you live and operate? It definitely made a difference for Simon and for Alexander and for Rufus and for Mrs. Simon. Again, this little verse completely unnecessary to the truth of the gospel, but I'm glad it's there. What a detail. And what an, what an event that may not be expounded upon in Scripture, but you know Simon never forgot it. But here's the thing, neither did Jesus. Neither did Jesus. You say, how far did he help him carry it? I have no idea, but it was far enough. Far enough for Jesus to say, write that down. Write that down. That man helped me bear my cross Write it down. And God doesn't forget. God hasn't forgotten Simon. And you say, well, I can't carry the cross very far. But carry it anyway, because God won't forget it. And he'll say, write it down. Write it down. Write her name down. She gave of herself. She gave her effort. Evidently, Simon was not a little puny man. A Roman soldier would not select a sickly little skinny fellow to carry such a cross. They evidently picked a man they thought was capable. And so there stands Simon. And Rome apprehends him. And he helps Jesus bear his cross. And Jesus said, it's not random. I understand. Write it down. Don't forget, so you and I, we try to do what we can and give what we give. We may not be the most gifted. We may not be the most talented. We may not be the, the greatest this or greatest that. But we give what we can and we do what we can do. And God says, write that down. Don't forget it. And I won't forget it. What a great moment. What a great moment. When man and the cross united, they're on the road to redemption. What a moment. I pray in your heart, as Miss Jessie comes, I pray in your heart that you've had such a moment, that there has been a, a time where the cross and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and yourself were united as one. I, I, I went several different ways trying to figure out how to preach this particular verse and and one of the things I wanted to, to mark was the, the merging of these two men. You, can, you cannot tell the story of Simon the Cyrene without telling this story. They're merged. They became one. And what an amazing thing, what an amazing moment when your story cannot be separated from the cross. Mine can't. When I get to heaven, my story will not be able to be separated from the cross that Jesus bore. The blood that he shed cannot be separated. What a great moment for Simon. Do you have such a moment? Do you have such a moment? Let's stand to our feet with every head bowed and every eye closed. They're going to sing. The altars are open. If you do not have such a moment, 
If you have never embraced the cross of Jesus Christ and embraced the blood that was shed for you, if you never embraced that, accepted that, and put your faith in that, I pray that would be the day. But many of you probably have. But maybe like Simon, you stand off resisting the call to come and bear the cross of Jesus Christ. I say come. I say bear it, pick it up, and carry it with Christ. Carry it with Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, bless this invitation, bless them as they sing. In Jesus' name.